seen the greatest gain in in-district schools than in-district schools. Uh, in the eighth grade math, okay, so I'm going to say, point for those of you who are in science or in mathematics. Hold that thought. Hold that thought. We're going to get oh, into report. Ready. No. We're going to get into report cards. Then we'll get into report cards in a second, okay? Uh, Give me a little bit more. That we have, I know we have kids that okay, go so to school in I'm the city say, of Philadelphia for those of you with us uh, today that don't go to any of those schools. They go to Catholic. We're going to get into report cards. No. We'll get into report cards in a second, okay? Uh, Give me a little does bit anyone else hear that? Or is it just kids that go to school in the city of Philadelphia with us? Oh, it's half that. I'm sorry. Forgive me. They go to Catholic. So we also have parochial and private schools. And so we have that as well. And we'll talk a little bit about that in a moment. Let me ask Lenny, Lenny, how are, how are we doing in Philadelphia? Are there some comparisons that can be made? You know, what does the Philadelphia educational quality look like? Um, tell us a little bit about that. Well, John, again, it's always good to be here in the, at the Union League. And usually I get an opportunity to see a lot of high school juniors, the best and the brightest for a good citizen day. But unfortunately, we have to talk about a lot of the other type of students that are in the Philadelphia school system and in the surrounding area, if you will. Those are the kids that are struggling. Those are the kids that are finding themselves struggling for generation after generation. And now that we seem to be on the other side of the pandemic, we're learning even more about what they've been missing. Now, if you ask John, how are they doing? I mean, there's one very simple answer I can give you. How's your crime rate? How's the health of our children? How's the mental and emotional health of our children? What's bullying been like since everybody's come back into school? These are symptoms of where they are academically. What we're finding is that we've seen some kids, particularly starting in the 2021 20, school year, that completely dropped off the grid. And when they came back into the schools, there was a larger gap than what we had seen previously. The level of parental satisfaction with schools in Philadelphia and across the country has gone down, which is why you've seen this, this wave of school choice. It turned over a gubernatorial election in Virginia. You're seeing legislation being passed as far away as Iowa, and you're hearing a Democratic newly elected governor in Pennsylvania say, yes, we should expand more options for parents. So in one regard, John, our kids are finding themselves struggling with the aftermath of a pandemic, but at least I think we're at a point in time where the adults are acting like adults in a room, which doesn't always happen in education, by the way, and they're actually hearing what the kids need, and maybe we're finally being more responsive to that. So the couple term, terms we've used here, and let's make sure everyone understands, what's a charter school? A charter school is basically a school that's been authorized by the Commonwealth of Pennsylvania starting in 1997 to be not a private school. It's a public school, but it has a little bit of flexibility to be able to address certain needs based on culture, based on academics, or based on parental need. For example, let's say you go into a particular area of the city and you say these kids over the last 40 years traditionally are two grades behind in reading. And you want to start John Miko Charter School, which I hear is a fantastic school, by the way. Yeah, sure, it would be. But you say, you know what? If you're going to come to John Miko Charter School, you're going to have two reading lessons a day. We're going to get you at 8.30 in the morning. But before you go, we're going to read once again at 3.45. Well, wait a minute. What do you mean 3.45? My kid used to get out of school at 2.45 at the local public school. No, we're going to extend the school day. We're going to add extra reading. We're going to add extra math. We're going to wear uniforms. We're going to tweak certain things by way of the charter that we're granted in this instance in Pennsylvania by the school district that you reside in to allow for those special needs, that special mission to be met, ideally to elevate the kid academically and scholastically, which is different. We oftentimes talk about the academics. But if you don't have the scholastic culture as well in the school, kids are bullied, kids are isolated. And you start going through the emotional things that we see our kids going through over the last 30 years that lead to the decay that we've been seeing with our youth. So what is, so you have a different academic perhaps center or interest or cultural interest that can be athletic interests mm -hmm. and music and, and something that makes it different. 
correct? It's a different. So tell me about Esperanza. Why is your, what's your charter school look like? Well, uh, we have um, 1,779 students. We decided that given the small amount of young people from our community that actually made it to college, that we wanted to do a college prep program. So you would ask what's different about a college prep program? Well, we created majors in the 10th grade. So we have a visual arts major, entrepreneurship major, dance major, music major, criminal justice major, film, drama, health sciences, engineering, journalism, and tech, tech majors. What makes it different is we created a system where almost all our students have the opportunity to take even one college course while they're with us. Exposure to college, to the concept that college, you should go to college even though your parents didn't, is very, very important. We take that for granted in many homes where we've gone to college. Uh, as first generation uh, college students or second or third. Luis, or let, me, let me push back on that sure. idea just for a moment. So I'm going to guess most of the people here went to college. Right. That's my, my uh, assumption. Except those two right there. Not yet. We'll, They'll get there. We'll get to them. We'll get to them. Should all their kids go to college? No, but every child should be, have the critical thinking skills to make a decision whether they want to go to college or not. And critical thinking skills are, are the difference between being successful at work and life or not. So our focus is there. If you can learn a, a, a skill and you have the critical thinking, you've developed your critical thinking enough to know, you know, I am never, I am never going to be a professional dancer. And you got to have the you have to have that skill. One of the big issues for our society and in our city is too many of our young people believe they're going to be the young person to make it in the NBA, in the NFL, in Major League Baseball. And that's just not the case. It's actually easier to become a brain surgeon than it is to get onto a Major League roster. So part of what we have to do is teach critical thinking skills in an environment that's safe, which is the other thing that most folks don't talk about. Charter schools tend to be safer than non-charter schools. There's reasons for that. The, the staffing is different. So we have four counselors. We have nurses. We have what are called climate officers. These are individuals who are taught. They're basically social workers who roam the halls and work with our kids. I think it's really important to understand that we're fighting against a system where most of the funding is not being spent necessarily in the best interest of the child. And if I, if I may just riff off of what, what Reverend Luis Cortez is saying, one of the things that we often don't talk about is culture. Culture matters. So it's interesting, John, you would say, well, you know, do, do all these kids, their parents didn't go to college, they're, they're going to a great school, Esperanza is a great school, I've had interactions with them over the years, do these kids have to go to college? Well, there's one argument that says, no, let's get them in the CTE, you know, career technical education, get them prepared to have careers coming right out, be plumbers, doc, you know, plumbers and, and those type of, with your hands type of jobs. But when you're African-American and you're a Latino and you start talking about how do you open up doors for yourself? and you talk about the barriers that they're used to having in society, black families have been taught since slavery. You gotta go get as much education as possible if you're gonna do anything in this world. So you have a natural pushback, even in a school choice movement, when you say, well, all black and brown kids don't have to go to college. A lot of times you hear the parents say, oh, yes they do. And there's a natural rub with that. Now he also mentioned something else that I think is important when you start talking about culture. He mentioned the different types of, staffers that they have at the school. Charter schools and schools of choice usually have a disproportionately higher amount of black and brown teachers. Did you know that there is a percentage of school districts in the Commonwealth of Pennsylvania? And then we have 500 school districts. I didn't know if you all realized that. There are 500 school districts in the Commonwealth of Pennsylvania. We hail from Pittsburgh. 
And even in Allegheny County alone, there's over 30 school districts in Allegheny County, which you all would look at and say, yeah, that's about a little town compared to Philadelphia County in this region. There is well over 30 school districts that haven't had one teacher of color in a decade. Think about the separation in traditional public schools. When kids don't see people that look like them, they can relate to what they're going through, what their parents went through, what their grandparents went through, and the same educational issues and systems that held them back. Charter schools go after that as well in these subtle ways that are meaningful. And these are the things that when you start talking about how do we change education, where they are, where are we going? These are things that if you're not addressing them, we sit here year after year after year with the same issues. So, we're, by the way, I just we're going to have another public affairs program. Where's Mike Rounds? I saw him earlier. And we're going to talk about this issue of, of traditional colleges as opposed to other uh, kind of career paths that kids can take. And I mean that for those of you that don't know, Mike, Mike runs uh, Williamson College of, I'm going to get it wrong, of Trades, uh, which is a great organization, which is about trade school, about teaching kids a, a trade uh, and, and a post high school environment. Um, but public schools. So I, I know there are people here that uh, have children that went to public school. My kids went to public school, not in Philadelphia. There, there are some here that did, and they're very happy. I know they had a good experience, maybe not all of them, but I know some of them did. Um, so that's a good thing, right? This is, this yeah. is a- That's and, the choice. Okay. So but if your public school is bad and or a poor performing school, and you don't have the money to send your child to a Catholic school or a, uh, a private school, you're stuck with that school. You have no other option. Your children are stuck with that school unless you have enough political ability to do what a lot of political leaders and others do with power, which is to move them to the non-neighborhood good school. There's some magnet schools. There's 12 opportunities in the city. But we know, I know of a lot of people who couldn't get their kids into the magnet school, but were able to leverage their relationships. But there's not enough relationships to leverage hundreds of kids who are stuck in a bad place. And so that's really what this question is about. Are there alternatives to a system that from the perspective of some community folks, enslaves them. They have no choice. They don't have the money to pay for a private education, so they must, and they don't have the political gravitas to get their child assigned to a good school. So they are stuck. And what we're talking about is, a, there are schools that less than 5% of the students will actually make grade in the city. These are really poor performing schools. And if you don't have a choice as a parent, if you don't have the money to send your child to a Catholic school, you're not gonna have the money to move out of the neighborhood. Because the Catholic school education is an affordable one on the private side. So these are some of the realities or the conflicts we have. And one of the things that I believe we need to figure out is how can we create school choice in an environment where systems are locked in both politically and, and in terms of the, the parties that, that uphold that structure. So we're in a constant uh, push and pull about what a charter school is, what it isn't, what it can do and it cannot do. But from my perspective, our charter schools allow things to happen that are different. So I'll, I'll give you an example. This year in our graduating class, for the first time, I have 22 students who are graduating. They're four years of high school, but they're also getting their associate arts degree in college with no debt. That, that, I could get an applause for that. <laughs> We, we were able to manage because I didn't have to have a dialogue. I wanna be clear about my perspective. I didn't have to have a dialogue with a union system. I can go straight to a college and I went to Eastern University and I went to Eastern University and said, I have all these kids. None of them, may, none of them might end up in college, but 
If you give us the opportunity, a lot of them will end up as your student. And they asked, what would that mean? It turned into 22 of 32. There was 32 in the cohort. 22 of these kids, of our young people, finished an associate arts degree while they were doing their college degree. They were willing to work. It was not given to them. They had to work longer days. That's okay. We live, we have a merit system in this country. What we have to do is provide opportunity. The problem we have is we don't provide opportunity. As long as opportunity is provided, individuals who want it will get it or whose parents want it will make them get it. And Luis, let me, let me, let me clarify something that people need to understand about the challenges we have in education, John. It's obviously a hat tip to the people at Osperanza to be able to have what they call dual enrollment, taking high school courses and, and earning college credits. But that was brand new because the General Assembly, after years of you know, organizations such as the National, uh, National Alliance for Public Charter Schools and PCPCS and PCE pushing for it, they finally passed a law that said charter school students can do dual enrollment. Just like every other public school student had been able to do for years prior to that. So then you got to ask yourself the question, if they're all public schools, John, why were the charter schools treated so differently? Well, we know that these kids are coming here because the parents are desperately looking for other options because this system isn't working, but this system was granted the opportunity to do that decades ago. And it took until 2023, in June, or actually, I think it was 2022 is when it passed, 22, for this to transpire this last budget season after multiple rounds of knocking on the door and hearing no, or maybe we'll get there or we'll pass it in the House, but we don't know if it can get through the Senate or it'll get to the House and the Senate, but we don't know if Governor Wolf's going to pass it or we're going to use it as a bargaining chip in order to get more money for this. And that's where our kids that need the help get trapped and a lot of them get lost. So let's talk about money. Um, since you brought it up, uh, how do, how do charter schools work? How do they get funded? What's, what's that look like? And go, go a little bit into the weeds on that, because I think it's important to understand how it works. It works in a very broken fashion. So in essence, I'll give you an example. McDonald's has been selling hamburgers for decades and they're sitting there on first street. We'll just call it first street. And McDonald's, Nautilus hamburgers used to be pretty good for a while. Then after a while, they wouldn't cook the burgers all the way through, or they'd say they'd be hot and they'd be lukewarm and it didn't taste very good. Some people were actually getting sick from these things. So Wendy says, you know what? I'm going to open up a Wendy's on 2nd Street because after all, people still like hamburgers in America. Well, there was a law in place that said McDonald's has to authorize Wendy's to open up the Wendy's on 2nd Street, one block down. They're not using their fryers. They're not using anything. They just want to have a chance, opportunity. But the law says, no, 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 you got to go through McDonald's first. That's how it is with charter schools and public schools. But let's take it one step further. It's not just the authorization of the public school district to allow a charter school to exist. It's literally the funding's going through as well. So the money's going to the public school first, knowing full well that this kid's been in a charter school for four years. But the way the law is currently in Pennsylvania is it has to pass through which is why a lot of times you will hear a public school district say, you know what, these charter schools are robbing us of our $15 million. Well, here's the issue. The money belongs to the families. It's allocated by the state based on what the, the local funding is for that one out of 500 school districts. Then from there, it's supposed to follow the kids. In 1997, they set up roughly seven to eight exceptions that said, okay, well, look, school districts still have school buses. They still have buildings. They still have other items that they have costs that they have to be able to trim off of that state money. Over the years, through politics, it's now grown up to over 20. Four, 24. So now what you have is a school district saying, well, you know, we have to buy new shoes for the kids. Wait a minute. No, you don't have to buy new. Yes, we do. And that's going to be a line item of, I don't know, a quarter of a million dollars. So rather than the money going to Luis's school, where the kid's been going since third grade, and now he's in eighth grade, it stays at the Lenny McAllister Public School District, even though I haven't seen that kid since that kid was out of, you know. So, so what's that amount to? So what, what's a, 
what's it cost so, to educate a kid in Philadelphia? So, Give us before I answer that question, that's a great question, John, but before I answer it, um, I do want to say I am a proponent for all public schools. I served on Governor Shapiro's uh, K-12 transition team, and I am on uh, Dr. Watlington's, who is our new school district superintendent. I am on his uh, advise, community advisory board for the schools. So I am a proponent of public education, um, which includes traditional and charter schools and other alternatives. The school district gets $17,985 per child. 17,985, I'm sorry, 983. Let me not pull off those two bucks, add $2. That's the money it gets, not from the federal, it gets it from the state and the city. Mm -hmm. Charter schools do not get the federal allotments. We have to get them from the federal government ourselves. Sometimes we do, most of the time we do but sometimes we don't. Nevertheless, at 17, the charter schools through a, a form that's called the 363 form, they were, uh, which was created under Governor Tom Ridge who created charter school law. That form has seven items that the school district can charge. Today, the school district puts 24 items on that form. That reduces the 17,983 to $15,751. It's about, a, um, it, that's how much is, is lost. So when I look at it from my school's perspective, we lose $3.97 million a year to the school district for their fixed cost. But my kids have fixed costs. We have to, we have to take a bond to build our school buildings. We have to do, we have school buses that have to get paid for. So we subsidize the fixed costs of the traditional system. My school alone at 4 million. Now think about it. My school has um, 1,779 students, right? 1,779 students provides $4 million, $4 million. And I told you earlier, there are six, 64,000 almost 65,000 students. It's over $250 million that is provided for, for overhead from the charter school students to the traditional school students, to the system. Yet the school teachers union and others continue to say that we are taxing them. I don't know, I think $250 million for overhead, I think they're taxing us. But that's not said. And one of the new things that we'll be discussing a little later is the, the new ruling that came out of the state, which says, which basically we'll talk about, which says that all students need to be equalized somehow. Didn't say how, that's always the question, how? But somehow we have to have equalization of funding for students in our state. Does the school district provide anything to the charter schools? Are there, in fact, services that they provide? Sometimes. I mean, sometimes you'll have a school district that will provide busing, but there was just a recent Commonwealth Court decision that basically said that they don't necessarily have to provide busing. I mean, literally, there was a school district that was so egregious in its delivery of education that they don't even have a high school anymore. This is in the Pittsburgh region. And so their elementary school students wanted busing to go to a charter school because that's the only way they're gonna get a good education in this town. The town said, you know what? You got seven second graders that are going to a uh, charter school across town. Here are these, in essence, SEPTA passes. They can get on three buses and get to school every day. We paid for it, congratulations. So these seven, eight-year-olds are expected to take these three city buses to get to school every day. They students said, no, 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 we need a safe school bus to drive them across town. You want them to take three city buses, get up at 5.30, quarter six in the morning by themselves and get to school. And the Commonwealth Court said, you know what? They're providing for the education. And there, there's been this back and forth of why a school district can, can provide needs in the way they see fit. Other times the busing available. I can tell you another scenario that happened recently with charter schools where the because you remember the school bus driver shortage, 
they went to the charter schools and said, oh, no, even though by law we're supposed to help provide uh, some drivers, we can't. So your kids are going to have to just tough it. Didn't matter what the law said. Didn't matter that the money was there. And it didn't matter to Luis's point that the 363 had already scraped off that money. It's sitting there in a, po- in a bucket. They didn't get the service that they needed. John, John, the charter school office of the school district for the $200 million has three people. That's three people on staff for the 200, three people, three, three, three people for the $200 million that we give for that certain for the school district to take care of us. In addition to which, what they do provide is they do take our statistics. We give them the raw statistics and they're able to put those pieces together. They do the reporting to the federal government um, and to the state government. So that's in addition to the three people who review our paperwork. So your, your school, is a, has a focus. There are other focuses. Can any, can any kid who wants to go to your school that lives in the city of Philadelphia go to your school? And let me ask a follow-up question. Is that the same if he run, goes into his local uh, public school? And I've often wondered this because we, uh, uh, we have schools that have music right. as their focus, right? right? So if you have no music ability, none at all, and you want to go to that school, you're going to cost them more Right. Right. Or if I wanted to go to an athletic school, that would definitely cost them more because they got to deal with, you know, me. Right. So is is this a self-selecting group that makes it easier, cheaper for you to educate the kid? There's two answers to that. So let me answer from my school's perspective. We have a lottery system. We have usually about a thousand people in the lottery for about 200 slots we have a way because of my my bond we have a bond we have a 38 million dollar bond in order to build our school and we got into an argument with our provider of our bond they wanted a thousand people on the waiting list we never take more than 30 to 40 people off that list on an annual basis because even when kids move the parents want them to stay in our school And as a result of that, I get 990, I get over 900 parents or families upset because it's like, where are we on the list? And how do you tell a parent, if you're past 50 on the list, the odds are very high you're not getting in. Um, So we have a thousand people on our waiting list every year because of my bond, I have to do that. Um, It's a lottery system. And because of all the accusations of government, it's done by a computer and it's it's uh, recorded so that if anybody ever wants to see it, let us know. We'll be glad to show it to you. It's it isn't rocket science. It's computer spits out the numbers. It's a random. But but do those thousand kids look like the average thousand kids across the city. My school is 100 percent. They look like the average kids of my neighborhood. Okay. So so I have to say it this way um, in our entire system. Uh, we're 1,600 1, kids, 100% minority, 94% Latino, 6% African American. That's just about what the community is. Um, we have some young people who lived in the neighborhood who moved up into the Northeast. Uh, we have some that moved up into South Philly or Chestnut Hill, but they stayed in our school. So let's let's talk about another. We were talking about funding. And I think I, I have a basic understanding of charter school funding. Lenny, what's a voucher? How does it work? A voucher basically is an allotment from the state that says, we're going to give a family a certain lot of money, and you can use this voucher to apply to tuition to any school you choose. So um, let's say you want to send your, your child to St. Joe's. I do not want to send my kid to St. Joe's. Yeah. Because <laughs> they would probably be beat by my my kids got into LaSalle, so you know they weren't going to St. Joe's. Touche. Let's say we're going to give you a where, uh, where are the prep kids? Uh, <laughs> yeah, they are. Uh, they're shaking their heads. We're both so shade at them up here. <laughs> I'm going to give you five thousand dollars, and you can apply it wherever you want. Now the flexibility with that is is 
It's state funding. We already said that the state's going to allot a certain amount of money for the public school education of that child. And if you go by the Constitution of the Commonwealth of Pennsylvania, there's an obligation therein for the state government to, pro government to provide that education, or at least the access to that education by way of financial support. Then it's up to the parent to apply it to the school that they choose. You take something like an ESA, an education savings account, it takes it one step further. It says, okay, we're not necessarily going to just limit it to tuition. We're going to then say, if you want to take this ESA and apply some of it to tutoring, to materials, to technical support necessary to allow your kid to do better, we're going to provide that as well. Now, this is where it gets a little sticky. And, and folks like Luis, we say we want school choice, but there are times we we want certain types of school choices. It's almost like animal form. All animals are equal, but some animals are more equal than others. <laughs> If you want school choice and the money is supposed to follow the child and we have learning loss going on after the pandemic and we have had social unrest with our youth now for probably 15 years. I mean, Ferguson wasn't that long ago. The riots and the uprisings of 2020 were certainly not that long ago. You look at what happened with Freddie Gray. You look at what's been going on in Chicago for the longest time and cities across the country, including here in Philadelphia, which is has some of the poorest congressional districts in the United States. You put all that together, there's obviously a need to do something different. But if you're limiting choice to just charter schools and you're not saying if this money is supposed to help the child be the best the child can be. And if that child is going to go to a school and we're gonna fund that and that child's gonna be a C student, you go, he's only a C student, but he goes to college, he does okay in college and finds his way after being a knucklehead in, in high school and having to drop out of school a little bit and transfer schools and then eventually finding his way and going from there, you know what they call that child, John? You know, I'll give you an example. Barack H. Obama, 44th president of the United States. The bottom line is education is supposed to give a family an opportunity for that child to find the best of themselves and their God-given destiny. If you talk about the founding documents, which this institution was founded on, that's the epitome of what a government's supposed to do. So where where do they where are the vouchers used? So the this the vouchers, how 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 big is the voucher system? Give me in some national uh numbers. well it it depends on the state. So right. for example, here in the Commonwealth of Pennsylvania, you have tax credits, it's not really a voucher. Right. So you basically have entrepreneurs and business people. And those of you that participate in the program, thank you so much. It's been around for decades now. You basically give money to a school and the school says, okay, we're going to provide these scholarships and then they take care of it. And basically it, it matches it. You, what you put into the system, you take off of your state tax. You have other states, Florida and, uh, and Arizona and others that just flat out give a family a voucher and says, we trust you, John. You, you do what's best for your children. There's currently a movement to have a federal tax credit scholarship program akin to what we have in here in the Commonwealth of Pennsylvania, which is why you've had presidents from Clinton all the way through Trump that have been paying attention to what we've been doing here to see if they can take that model and put it one step further. Now, ideally, if that works out, we'd be able to have something at the federal level and the Commonwealth level, and that might open additional doors for kids. Luis. Concerns about this? What are your yeah, thoughts? Yeah, the concern is a lot of time the conversation about the vouchers is about two or three or four thousand dollars. And if it's a family that's in poverty that can't, the the least expensive schools are six to eight thousand dollars, which are traditionally, I would say, um, Catholic education, which is the most affordable private education, school education that's available everywhere. Right. So from my perspective, I'm not against vouchers. I'm against cheap vouchers. If we're going to do vouchers, my perspective is each child gets seventeen thousand nine hundred and eighty three dollars. And with seventeen thousand nine hundred and eighty three dollars, I'm sure that the best schools in our region, all of the best schools in our region can cap whatever the rest of the need is to take the best and the brightest from all our communities into those schools. The problem is with a 4,000, I don't want to mention any schools, but uh, I'll mention a school, my daughter went to Abington Friends School. If I went to Abington Friends School with a $4,000 scholarship and they gave me a half scholarship, I'm still almost 15 grand short. Where does it come from? 
So it's not going to happen. So what, we, what I'm for is true vouchers, true choice. If it's seven, if the school district, if the city and state provide $17,983 for a student and a parent can get that money and your child, that parent's child is good enough, they will get into any school because any school will be glad to provide $7,000, $8,000, maybe even $12,000 to, to get that child into that community. I mean, a lot of our prep schools, uh, I'm not talking to any prep school in here, but a lot of our schools find ways to get sports stars into their community from North Philadelphia, right? So it's harder if you're going to try to get all the kids that should be in that school, that qualify to be in that school in terms of academics or a special gift or an, a special ability. So from my perspective, the best way to do it is true choice. And that's never been part of the dialogue. It's always been, we'll give you $5,000 or four. And to me, that's just not enough money to make it happen it, it, for a family. But that's politics though. That, that's yeah. the political wrangling. That's not necessarily the money that we have available, John and, and Louisa and, and folks out there. A lot of what transpires is the fact that we're trying to figure out ways to mitigate this. And now it becomes a negotiation of who's expendable and who's not. So, okay, let's say there's a, for every hundred kids that's on a wait list that wants to have a voucher to go to a school, there's a negotiation oftentimes in Harrisburg that says, it's okay for 10 kids to make it out. But if we're gonna hire a certain amount of teachers and we're gonna hire a certain amount of administrators and we're gonna donate to the PSEA and we're gonna donate to PASBO and we're gonna use that money to see who we can get to get elected to the next gubernatorial race or who we're going to find the next state senator to be because we're going to politicize that money. Well, you got to have 90 kids in this system. Luis is providing you the number. Very easy. Do 90 times 17 in that scenario. You can't politicize that money. You can't use the money on adults in systems, not students, as Corey DeAngelis likes to say. You can't do that if you at least allow everybody the opportunity because now it's not 90 anymore it's maybe 50 maybe it's 60 and now you're talking about true choice but you're also talking about true reform too all right i, I want one more subject and i want to leave some time for for some questions so two weeks ago uh pennsylvania commonwealth court made a decision uh about funding essentially for schools in the state of pennsylvania lenny tell us about that case and what are its implications? It's going to be very interesting. So basically what the court said was that the Commonwealth of Pennsylvania, by way of its constitution, has an obligation to provide public education for its youth. And that because of the current funding structure that's in place, again, I told you 500 school districts. So we're talking about 500 funding formulas and 500 different levels of what's going into a per student, what they call an ADM. That that is unequivocally unequal. So basically the challenge is, okay, we know that you're not gonna be able to meet the mandate as required by the state constitution, fix the funding structure. So you say, okay, what does that mean? That means something that people have been working for decades to put into place, John, you now have to break it. You now have to change it. You now have to do something reform, which is going to be revolutionary and difficult if it gets done. Because you have to remember, for decades, Pennsylvanians have been picking and across the country as well, where they're going to buy a house, where they want to live, based on what? The school district. And so when you start saying, no, 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 you decided to buy that $2 million house. But now it doesn't matter because we're going to put just as much money into your school district as we're going to put into a school district 150 miles away. And if that means some of that money from your school district is going over to that school district, you just got to deal with it because it is court case. You can imagine there's going to be thousands of Pennsylvanians that are going to say, I don't necessarily agree with the court. So now we have a challenge as to how do we do this based on a structure that we have put into place? And by the way, you got to replicate this 500 times. So this is a this is a big idea, 
right, Luis? This is a yeah. really big idea. Tell me about the constitutional piece in this, or what, there was a, right. uh, you may even have it right there. I, have, I brought it because I figured we'd, we're going to talk about it. Um, the ruling had seven points and point six and seven, I guess, are the most important. Uh, and this was by Judge Rene Cohn Chubelier, who was the presiding judge on a case that took 10 years of litigation. The disparity among school districts with high property values and incomes and school districts with low property values and incomes is not justified by any compelling government interest, nor is it rationally related to any legitimate government objective. And, and here's the, the bottom line here, as a result of these disparities, petitioners and students attending low wealth districts are being deprived of the equal protection of law. Now, this means that somehow we're going to come up with a number that's more than the lower school districts and probably less than the higher school districts and figure out how to fill that gap. And I want to, I received several emails over the last couple of weeks about this, different articles uh, commenting on this. The most interesting one I received was Philadelphia Inquirer's article, which did a piece on this, which was very positive. And then I received from Commonwealth Foundation, this may be the first time this ever happened, uh, actually another one for commenting, Commonwealth's commenting, not just on the case, but sharing the Philadelphia Inquirer uh, article. And I, I say that just to tell you, this is, this is a true issue that's resonating with people on all kinds of the political spectrum. Uh, am I right that the Attorney General, then Attorney General Shapiro, um, was supportive of this, would have been, based on what he said previously, supportive of this decision, as far as we can tell, now governor. It's a lot before, harder. Before he was governor. Exactly. Now, it's a lot harder now. now. I'd have to do you, it. You have to right. figure out how to do it. And I don't see it as a simple, every legislator has a say. Yeah. So I'm assuming it's going to take a while to figure out what what is the right number, because that's I'm assuming that will be the first decision. What is the right number? And the highest paying school districts, that's not going to be the number. It's going to be a lower number. It's going to be higher than Philadelphia, by the way, is not the lowest paying school district by far, by the way. Uh, there's some that are yep. like eight or nine thousand yep. throughout the state. Exactly. So per student. So the question is, how many students are at eight thousand? How many are at fifteen thousand? How many are at thirty thousand? And it's also mean testing. So, for example, we asked the question, how much does it cost to educate a child? Right. Well, there's a difference between how much does it cost to educate a child in Lancaster versus how much does it cost to educate a child in Philadelphia? How much does it cost to educate a child in Erie? How much does it cost to educate a child in Center um, County? And then bring that together. Because an education looks very different in Greene County when you're bordering West Virginia than it does in Center City, Philadelphia. And there's different expectations. And then on top of that, what are we calling education? Because if we're talking about people being aggrieved, is there then an obligation to also deal with the gaps that some of these areas have had for quite some time. And to Luis's point, if you think that legislators, and again, we have one of the most bloated legislatures in the country, you have 203 people in the House alone, which is literally half of the House of Representatives in Washington, D.C., by and large. You think they're not going to sit there and say, don't just give us $10,000, which brings us up $2,000. You need to give us another 1500 because we've been sitting at this low level for 40 years. And my whole community is behind as a result, and the, and the employers have left and everything else. This is going to become a political football that maybe school choice solves with a voucher program and new funding. Will it be upheld? I think it will. I think the real issue is it took 10 years to get the ruling. Will it take it's going to take another 10 years to get the number. And so I, I think it will be upheld because the state, does have a compelling interest to make sure that every child under the state has the opportunity. How we define that is very difficult because as, as was being said, 
there's education is not just one way of doing it. It's not just one cost. And so there is a compelling interest when a school district, if it's getting $6,000 a child and it doesn't have good school buildings, there is a compelling interest for the state to take care of those children. The real issue is if there is what was in other states are used the equalization bill, which means a school district can do property taxes can be used however you want, but there's gonna be, this is the number that's gonna get met. And then if some school districts don't have it, basically through some taxation of the entire state, they come up to that number. That doesn't mean that a school district that is higher will have less. So that may take, that's really important because it maintains property values. And it means someone's going to pay more. Yes. 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 And the other thing you have to think, <clears throat> take into consideration, John, is it's not just the money. There are other things that we have to look at in education. It does obviously impact money, but, or has influence with money. But for example, if you're in a rural area, I told you about the discrepancies with teachers of color, but let's go to teachers overall. If you're in a rural area and the teacher to student ratio is 24 to 1, and you come from a more affluent area and you're used to more like a 18 to 1, we can tweak the funding all we want. Are we going to tweak those ratios as well? And if you tweak those ratios, how does that impact the funding? These are things that have to be thought about. The, the beauty of being on the bench is you get to be an idealist in some regards. You look at the Constitution, you look at the law, and you say, you know what? This is how the world should be. You know what? I think every kid should have a lollipop as well. But if you don't have enough money in your pocket and there's not a candy store that's open, not every kid's going to get a lollipop. Guess who has to figure out who gets the lollipop? It's the people with the money in their pockets, and it's usually the parents of the kids. And that's where we are at this point in time. Someone's made an idealistic perspective. It's sound, it makes sense, but how do you do it? And then how do you do it in a political environment where the unions, particularly teachers unions, have had such a hold on education for so long and they influence so much and yet 500 different fiefdoms that you got to convince to try to play along nicely finally. Okay, look, I want to get to a few questions. I know we only have a couple minutes uh, left. We have, please use the microphone because um, we are streaming. And please, of course, keep your questions to, um, well, questions. Uh, so we'll go right here, sir. Yeah, uh, thank you. And thank you for the program tonight. I just, I, I want to really hammer home this point of what does it cost to educate a student? Reverend, you talked about it. You run a, a charter school network. So obviously you're familiar. School district is spending over $4 billion a year we have under 40% proficiency, right? It's not even just school by school. As a district, we're under 40% pr proficiency in reading. We're under 30% proficiency in math. math. What on earth is going on at the district level? And even if we get a bump in funding, what's going to make a difference? What, where's the measurable difference for parents like us who have kids in the school district? I'll talk to you over a bottle of wine when we get done. But in the meantime, I'll answer it this way. Um, funding helps, but it isn't the all in all, right? And I really believe that, I believe in trying to find a way to get, I don't want to call it equalization, but get to a more normative understanding of what should be the number. I also believe that Every school should have certain things. We have things that other schools in my neighborhood don't, but why don't they? So I don't know how to answer it because I'm not in charge of that other system. I know that I get less money per child. I know I, get, I wouldn't take that job. So I know I get less money uh, per child, but we have counselors. We have, we have security. We have all these other things that for some reason, the traditional system falls short. Well, and, and if I may, just very quickly, it, it's a fundamental shift in, in vision. If you look at education as an industry, it's never going to change because you're going to put more money in, you're going to have a product that comes out, including more employees. If it's a vocation, if it's a way of life, if it's a calling like it used to be, now the money goes back towards teachers, not administrators. Now the money goes towards different types of items that go directly into education. Yeah, right. I mean, truth of the matter is at one point in time, we were spending 50 cents on every dollar on teachers' pensions, not teachers teaching in the classroom. 
So when you start looking at that dynamic, you start looking at the fact that there are things that we used to call a Commonwealth Foundation and ghost teachers, where in the contract they negotiated a certain allotment of teachers that all they would do was union work all day long and not teaching in the classroom. And that was protected by the contract between the union and the school district. As long as it stays in industry, we're going to have problems. If, it's a, if it ends up being a vocation again, that's how we can save more of our kids. Here, a question over here. Um, so, it just amazes me that we're having such discussions in 2023. Um, you know, I had, uh, I, I read the other day that uh, in Baltimore, there's 23 schools where no one functions yep. in math. I don't think that's that much different in Philadelphia. And having fights about funding ratios and how much money we get per kid and things like that. You think this would be a full-blown five alarm crisis that's going that's generational it's not just it just didn't come upon us and it, it just it just seems that when I'm, I'm listening to you gentlemen that um you know the suburbs is going to sit this out forever because it's not their fight and letting you fight it you can't win because you're 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 tugging on each other and i think i think simply put if you had somebody from Overbrook walk, walk across the street and go to Lower Marion, I think you'd get some amazing results and have somebody from Mount Airy walk across the street and go to Upper Double. Well, and if I may, I, let me address that. I know we have to pivot quickly, but I think I don't think the suburbs is going to sit this one out because the bottom line is the crime is not coming to the suburbs. And the bottom line is the Chinese are not coming to the United States. And now the jobs that we used to have in the United States are not going every place else. And the bottom line is the quality of life in the United States of America and everything that we stand for is our way of our constitution and the things that we believe in and hold dear to our hearts is being lost because we are losing our youth from the inside out. So if the suburb sits out, which I don't think they will, which is why you're seeing this uprooting and, and this wave of school choice. If we don't take it over now, urban, suburban, exurban, we're going to lose what America is and the standing that we've had in this in the world since World War II is going to be lost within the next two decades. I don't think that's going to happen. And that's why I don't think the suburb is going to sit it out. One last question right here. Well, thank you very much. Up to now, I've heard people saying that the charter schools and the choice is a club to use on the public schools to scare them to see that they're going to lose the money. And so I wonder, if you were running a public school now, is there anything in the world keeping you from having, say, a school within a school, doing a couple of your own charter type things, like giving that extra English, requiring it? And Yes, yeah, there is. What stops? You're right. going to say it's the first, union. The first thing, a lot of times, it's a, it's a union contract, sir. It's the union saying, you know what? Can't do My it. contract says I leave at 3 o'clock every day, and you're telling me i got to extend the school day to 4 o'clock? Guess what we got to do? It's called a renegotiation. And when you start looking at where superintendents are and where school boards are, which, by the way, superintendents are hired and school boards are elected. People don't want to go through that. They don't want to have that level of flexibility to make the changes. Now, ironically enough to your question, charter schools were supposed to be incubators that the public schools looked to, worked with, and then took the best ideas from. That's that started out being that way, but then they became direct competition because, as Luis mentioned, from 2005 to let's go to the, the pandemic, you started underneath 100,000. During the height of the pandemic, we were at 170,000 students in charter schools, which was at the fifth highest level in the United States for that year. They don't want to look at those incubators anymore. They look at them as competition. And so as long as you can keep the system the way it's been, the money keeps flowing in and it goes back to the previous point. It's an industry that's a good industry. You can retire at 55 and live another 35 years on somebody else's dime. You're not going to find too many other people that are going to do that. I mean, usually it's people that are union members or politicians. I can answer this way. I, I could answer that question succinctly. I am, a, I am a public school, and our product is better. And do you have unions? No, sir. Are you allowed to? If we want it. If the teachers want it to organize, they can. They have tried to organize our school. They have not been successful today. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, I want to thank Lenny and Louise. Please join me in thanking them. Thank you. Thank you.
I hope you'll join us on March 6th for our next program of this series, which will be on quality of life and crime with another great panel. Have a wonderful evening. We'll see you on March 6th. Thank you. Thank you.